I'll convene to order. This is our Academy Community Center Building Committee meeting um, for attendance today. Um, Dave Spraley, the Vice Chair. And Kelly. And we are missing Joan, uh, Joe Paradiso, and um, Joe Valentine, our chair tonight. So we do not have a quorum. There's only three of us. Um, we also have a, a member um, that we're trying to fill the position. I think that's still open. Yes, it's still now. open. Yep. All right, so only six of us currently. Um, moving on to the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, I think we will do that tonight. Everyone's on board. All right, um, item three on our agenda is approval of minutes. Um, obviously, we can't approve these tonight. Um, is there any reason? And then you could add things to them, right? To be over the next time. Yeah, you have any, I don't, but <laughs> you know. One thing that I um, thought we had discussed in the second meeting was the possibility of scheduling uh, a joint meeting with the advisory committee. Mm -hmm. Do you want that to be in the minutes? Is that I was hoping we announced that that was missed. I don't know if we made any decisions on that last meeting. I know we discussed it. Did you have that in your notes? Yet? The note I have was that we were going to make it an agenda item for an upcoming meeting. Okay. So we'll add that for the next one. Right. Moving on to uh, item four, chairs, uh, comments. Um, one comment that I know is in the works that you guys may not be aware of is the town is working on putting an RFP together for the environment to consult it. You know, John, I put some input into Aaron. Um, I haven't seen anything on the status of that. No, I haven't seen anything from her yet. Okay. I thought in the next few days she was going to try to get that. There was a doubt. Yes. Yeah. Probably so I'll follow up with her on that. Right. I just want to make that a note because uh, uh, they had used Fuss and O'Neill to do the original report, uh, but due to the funding or the grant that's in place, they actually have to put out an RFP. It's one of the requirements. So the town's got to actually put it out for a consultant. You can't just use Fuss and O'Neill. So, sure. so just item of note there. Um, and all anything else, um, move on to liaison reports or comments. Um, Al, do you have anything? I do not. All right. Thank you, Al. Um, public comments. Anybody have any comments from the public tonight? No hands are raised. Perfect. Thank you. I forgot we're online. <laughs> um, so new business. Um, so we have three invoices um, that we had received, um, that we had reviewed, um, we had planned on voting on tonight. Um, one was a QA&M um, invoice through the end of March of 2023, the amount of $26,230.56, and that's part of their professional services. Um, I believe that was just 20% of the conceptual uh, design uh, cost that was there. Did we have any comments? And I know we can't vote on it, but did anybody have any comments, AJ or Dan? No. I mean, is there, I a, it, is there a schedule? So there's like a schedule of values. It's kind of attached to the their their um, invoice. Um, you know, twenty percent at this point seems appropriate um, for where they were. Um, <laughs> so we can discuss it, AJ. Um, 
for the next meeting. Yeah, I didn't know if there was like some offer that you'll have a when you deliver X. If it you, even comes if to you don't have on your sheet, you can come in and find a couple of Oh, I haven't pulled up. Okay. I didn't have a, I didn't know. That's why I was asking if there was a separate schedule of delivery milestones. No, we have a loose schedule that we worked out with Colliers regarding delivery right now. The proposed delivery of the schematic design phase is essentially June 1st ish. Um, so our billing for schematic design in theory would be complete 100% around June 1st. Um, we bill based on, we bill monthly, we bill based on our percent complete of each particular phase. So we don't go in direct alignment with your schedule, but in theory would be, we'd be 100% complete with schematic design in three weeks. Um, our billing tends to be a month or 30 days behind where our completion time frame is, um, just because we prefer to bill after we've delivered the work to you. Um, and we're also subject to the committee's approval at our invoices. So again, if you feel like we're not there or if the committee determines we're not there and doesn't approve the expenditures, then have that jurisdiction. Okay. Yeah, so this is through the end of March. Jay. Okay. The 20%. So that would have been like your field visits, your measuring, mm -hmm. your, you know, putting the concepts starting design. So if you look at it from starting in March 1st. Yeah, this is not 20% of the entire bill, though. It's no, 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 no. no, no. Schematic no, no. Design. Exactly. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. It's only 20% of the schematic design. Sure. I'm like, yeah. no, no, no. We're missing a zero somewhere then. Yeah. Okay. No, it's actually a pretty small bite in the apple. And keep Got in it. mind that a, a good sized chunk of our contract is actually in the construction and bidding phase of the work. So a, a big chunk of Total fee goes, you know, doesn't even get considered until after you're out the bid and construct. Okay. We can't actually approve anything. We can't. It's right. only three of us. Uh, and if there's a concern from a financing perspective, we probably will have to talk about getting that approval to you sooner rather than later. If it's not a major concern right now, we can table it for two weeks. So process question, the invoices, when they come to us, they have already been through Colliers, is that correct? Actually, no. Uh, today was the first time I had seen that, so I don't know if they need to be you know, forwarded to us at the same time that you're receiving them. I'm not sure. I just got them today, too. Oh, okay. So, so they got sent to the street to the board. town? Yep. Okay. Is that the way we had set up? I don't remember that, do you? No. Um, I thought they were supposed to re be reviewed by I call them before and project say manager, yes. As manager, I would want colliers to be able to weigh in with, with you know, usually, yeah, the we, we look at those. Right. <clears throat> it's typically a process issue. Our, our contract is with you. Right. So we send you our invoices. You then refer them to colliers for review. I can send them to both of you at the same time um, in moving forward. I mean, I make a bill, right? Send it out. It's probably it'll probably expedite things to yeah, do so. that. Okay, sure. <clears throat> that makes sense. I mean, for what it's worth, I have no issue or problem with the with the input. Right, right. right. But, but to the forward, particularly when we actually get into construction. Oh, certainly, right. Yeah, yeah. 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 Get, the, get this process stuff ironed out now, and we do streamline. Right. Uh, we'll move on to item eight then, so we can't uh, vote on item seven. Um, discuss and approve reimbursing QAM for the water flow testing. Um, that's exceed fifteen hundred. Um, that's a bill from the, the Connecticut Water Tom to, to provide the water flow test. That's correct. So um, this is a this is a, this is testing outside of our contract. Um, it's to determine what's the water pressure at the main, um, to see how that would impact whether, you know, whether or not we need a fire pump um, or 
pressure to provide um, sprinkler service to the building. Um, it's fifteen hundred dollar cost. We would treat it as a reimbursable to our contract, so we would just pass it through our contract to you. Um, so um, that's what that is. You can't vote on it tonight, but so that you know what it is for the next uh, next meeting. And it, it was requested by your sub. So that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. they can design the sprinkler system and determine what what's going to be needed. Mm -hmm. um, we're still actually trying to identify if we need to provide a sprinkler system for the building. The existing building does not have sprinkler. Um, there's a small window that would it be necessary, but um, if we need to put a fire pump in the building because you don't have enough pressure that has a significant cost impact to the project, just because it's not just the fire pump, it's also an emergency generator for the building. So we need to determine that. We can't really determine any of that without knowing what's the water pressure. You um, can't determine whether we need a sprinkler or not without doing that. Well, that's interesting because one of the one of the reasons in the code for not providing a sprinkler system is if you don't have enough, if you don't have adequate pressure. To provide it. So the international existing building code allows you not to provide a sprinkler system. And one of the reasons is if you don't have enough water pressure. So doing the water test will also help us determine whether or not we have to provide sprinklers in the building or not at this particular site. So the building requirement for sprinklers. We don't, it doesn't meet that requirement to need sprinklers. A new building of this type yeah. would require sprinklers. But so we're renovating an existing building. The existing building code allows much more flexibility um, regarding whether you'd have sprinklers or not. Sprinklers are always a recommended amenity to the building. But if we have to provide a fire pump and a generator, then we may want to consider our option. We'll probably still need some sort of fire alarm based of course system. It's, no matter what, you'll need smoke detection and, and you'll need a fire fire alarm system. system. Right. Yeah. So that that's automatic. Okay. Did did we carry the sprinkler system in, in, in the budget that we had to now, John? I oh, we didn't get don't know the specifics. I, I think that was just part of the in you know, the hard costs or the construction costs. The most current projections of MEP replacement include cost for fire protection to the tune of seven dollars square foot ish. Um, so yes, I mean we're presuming we're putting sprinklers in there, but we're not. It's not taking into consideration of fire pump or, or emergency generation. And again, just, I mean, it's one of this committee's tasks is going to be a balancing act. If you fix budget, you know, what do we spend our dollars on? And, right. But what you're saying, though, is if we do have the water pressure, then we're going to have to put a sprinkler system in. Or not necessarily if we do have the water pressure, then I think it's going to be difficult to say we can't. We're yes, we're gonna have to put the sprinkler system in, but the good news is we won't have to provide fire pump and the generator. The worst case scenario is we don't have the water pressure, we still have to put it in. That's well, well. Yeah. That may, okay. yeah, I mean, different perspective from a financial standpoint, yes. That's what I meant. Sorry. From a life safety standpoint, no. Right, yeah, to be clear from a financial perspective. But what is the right thing to do to save like that's the other? Well, that's that's a tricky question, and we'll be meeting with town staff as well. But if the code if the code says it's not required, then, then it's not required. The code is the sort of the ladder of the law. Um, the fire safety code has different 
you know, position and the fire marshal may have a different position. So it's still a work in progress. I don't want to sit at this table and, and say, hey, this is what we're doing. Yeah. Um, the bottom, at the bottom line is, I need to do water test and see what's there because it'll give us more information about which way we have to go. We need to test stuff as soon as possible. It's, it seems like a, yeah, it seems like it's worth doing. Yeah. The test. I did reach out to the towns and facilities department to see if they could handle this, but got pushed back to us. I didn't know if they had an account with them and they could just call me. Yeah, yeah, too bad that the town has to pay. There's no agreement between the town and work. I don't think they, uh, it matters if you're a town or a private, private citizen, everyone pays the, the fee, unfortunately. All right, we're going to have to table this one to next meeting too for approval, <coughs> unfortunately. Um, item nine is discuss and approve hiring down to earth consulting for geotechnical services in the amount of 8250 from the University of QAM for the expenditure. Um, bedrock corn is not in, in the estimate. They need to build at $35 for linear foot. Um, for rock core, um, Tom, can you just elaborate a little bit on this? Yep. So, Geotechnical testing is an owner's expense. It wasn't a part of the RFQ. It was it was um, left out of architectural services. Um, Colliers International had a budget, I believe, of was it ten or ten thousand dollars for <laughs> geotechnical testing. In our proposal, we carried an alternate cost of twenty thousand dollars for geotechnical testing. My structural engineer has priced it out and has solicited pricing of 8250, which is less than your, your budget allocation for that work. Um, we recommend it be done as a courtesy to, to the project, to the community. We would pass that cost through our contract, but it's a pretty significant amount. I don't want to pull the trigger on that without um, this committee. Um, agreeing to allow us to build that as a reimbursable to our contract. So instead of um, the town <laughs> buying that directly, um, they would pay, the town would pay, pay it through our contract as a reimbursable. And what is that by that's for the geothermal system so or that's, for foundation system? That's for the preliminary soil conditions to determine where the water table is um and i believe i can confirm that i believe that we do some preliminary borings for soil conditions for the geothermal oh no it's, uh, no, it's not the, it's this is for the structural it's not the geothermal test the geothermal core testing are an actual well they have to actually drill a well so this is different than the geothermal i think this is for the elevator and Structural. This right? is for structural soil. Right. I was just wondering if we're bringing a machine out that does the work, could we do some of it together? Well, I think this is only going down like 13, 14, 20, this, this, 20, this is a small feet. like drill rig on the back of like a truck that just goes. Oh, okay. So this isn't like a big, rig. big drill rig. And I think they had a couple of test pits in there. They wanted to do also yeah, they're going to do some samples in the courtyard. And um, so this is outside. So they the precise locations for the building. Um, we've the structural engineer has given preliminary locations to the uh, to the geotech uh, engineer, but it's 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 actually going to be mostly um, courtyard building. I, I, I did note in reading the, through the document that um, the town will need to clear any that might be in the way of it. We would coordinate that. Well, but it would be an additional expense. I don't know. There's, there's, there's no, so they had, wide open no, they had an hourly rate for delays if there was something in the way. So, to Anne's point, we'd probably want to see the plan ahead of time to see where the locations were so we can coordinate with the town if you want to move. I will make sure. Right? But, it's, but it's all quite adjacent to the building. It's not. That's my, my second question had to do with um, scheduling conflicts. If there were. Be heading towards the fields, for example, the field is going to be in use on that day. But I believe you're right, you're in the courtyard area, which is not the other side. So that's not an issue. Yeah. 
Yeah. So. Yeah, we're trying to find out what is in that section of the building where we put the elevator tower. We're trying to find out what the soils are adjacent to that entryway. So they're going to drill some borings outside the building. They're going to dig some test pits inside the building. We can't get them in there yet. In the but I can get the, I can coordinate the schedule, get, get the diagram showing where the test pits are going to be. And I can get that to you and we would coordinate to make sure the access is clear and there would be no additional costs. Yeah, it's like $350 an hour or something for delays. So, what to mitigate those? Yeah. Right. Like the scaling costs. That's it? Nothing. That's one of those costs. So, oh, yeah, whatever. Our, our, uh, our foundation driller at work gets $32,000 an hour. Really? So we got to table this one to the next meeting for approval. Uh, moving on to item 10 is Collier's update. John, what do you have for us? Um, to be honest, not too much since the uh, last week's meeting. Um, I did send the uh, version, which was in the uh, package that went out, that you have hard copy that we did as well. Um, we will be uh, looking to uh, put out the RFP as soon as we estimate the scope of work. And that's coming up. Uh, I don't know if there's any updates as far as any of the site visits scheduled. I haven't heard any updates on either the window or the brand or the locations of those that occurred. I can put that in the uh, schedule officially, but if not, um, that's, uh, that's all we have for the schedule update at this point. We're waiting on Joe. Yeah. I'll to come back. Yeah. It's going to come to the internet. All right, that's fine. You know, one comment I would have, John, I don't know, um, you know, last or last week listening to Tom's um, synopsis or overview of the mechanicals and some of the costs that he was, numbers he was throwing out there. Um, at some point, it'd be good to kind of compare those to what we were carrying on our estimate. I don't know how far down the line we are. Tom, with that, we can kind of get some. I know these are rough numbers, not estimates from contracting or anything, but um, I think we, we all have concerns here with some of these costs. And just kind of like um, compare them to what we were, was carried in, in the you know, original meetings. Um, look for any opportunities we can um, to save some money. At the end of the schematic design phase, you'll have scope of work that you want to accomplish and you'll have the cost associated with that and at that point you'll be in a really good position to see where you are make assessments in terms of the original budget and then make you know, project direction decisions um, at this point the numbers i presented last week were just off the cuff numbers and, and they're really not something that yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's typically something at the end of the SD phase, at yeah. the end of the schematic design, yeah. uh, when the estimators will look at the documents and you know, determine a little bit more uh, accurately what those uh, costs would be. And then, um, you know, to John's point, that's you know, sort of when the value engineering uh, phase you know, takes over and you start assessing um, with more definitive numbers what things are costing versus what the uh, you know, budget has available. I mean, I think the thing I was talking about last week is, you know, these MEP numbers are half of what our construction costs are. And I don't know, looking at, the, looking at that estimate, if that's what was predicted or not, right? But these, no, these are real numbers. Not. I mean, these are. Yeah, that was not the anticipated figure at that time. But, um, you know, until, you know, the drawings are done to a point in the SD phase to be able to, you know, truly analyze it by estimators, it is probably a little bit premature to, you know, try to do a cost comparison. <laughs> the purpose of my my comments last week weren't so that we do an instant evaluation of where we are. I just want to put the committee on notice that costs in the industry have gone through the roof, and that 
No, we're gonna just to be prepared that we may have to make scope decision, uh, you know, direction decision, um, as opposed to it being a monstrous surprise when we get see when we get all the information six weeks from now. I mean, because our, our referendum was in what, February of 2022? I don't know the last time that that budget was reviewed, but I mean, escalation was to the roof in 2021, right? I don't know if we capture any of that. 2022 has been kind of flat compared to 2021. Well, referendum, um, referendum prep is, I believe, at a minimum 90 days for that. So it was, in, it was back in the fall of 2021 when all of that together and I, I can't speak to that but uh, mark definitely that might lead to my next question i know when when mark was here um, we had talked about trying to get grants and reach out and try to investigate and i think mark mentioned that you guys had somebody in your staff that may be able to assist us with that i mean we have uh yeah a couple of people i can follow up with him uh, he wasn't able to be here tonight that's what's right. available to be uh, indicated for the next couple of days certainly so you know, he can speak to that yeah, right. maybe he's take a note or something because I, you know, we're yeah. going to have to definitely investigate this going forward as a focus. <clears throat> All right. So you said that Mark will be available for the next meeting? Yes. So, yeah. All right. Um, leads us to our next item, which is a QA and M updates. Uh, you have an update for us, Tom? So, please do. Good news. Oh. Um, yeah. So, I don't know if we, Gene. I'm trying. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. There so, were three files. Which one would you like? Uh, PowerPoint? The the one that says show or final show, I think all three of them will do the same thing. Two big handle up here too. Technically it's for all it's not pushed the technology right. Right. Uh, right, right. Twenty minutes to get the media <laughs> started. Yeah. So um, since our last meeting, we did. We did have a very good kickoff and coordination meeting in house. Um, and we're underway with MEP teams. I've got the site civil and survey teams underway. They're doing their field work, I believe, this week. Um, and the uh, MEP contract, MEP subcontractor has been engaged and is uh, moving forward. Um, we're working on our contract with the site civil site civil team and with the landscape architect primarily we've been focusing on the building design uh, incorporating a lot of the comments that we received last week making sure those are in the design itself and then uh, you know adding layers to the design so I was hoping we would get to see some of that. So final show, if that'll open, great. If not, you can open the PowerPoint. Share, you could have to share your screen. She is. Can, um, can you drag it to that screen? Like drag your, your screen over? That's not a good sign. I'm not the tech guy. Are you seeing that? Are you seeing that on your screen? She's got it on her lap on her uh, laptop, but it's not showing on that screen. Oh, how's that connected to that screen? Just okay. 
So you can use the right arrow. All right. So here are the satellite image of the site, and we expanded it so you could see all of the athletic fields, um, the basketball court that's at the back of the parking lot, and then the playscape, which is off to the um, the left of the site, which is actually the southwest corner of the back portion. A lot. Next slide. So this is the design that we showed last week, and we talked about uh, coming up with an alternative design to address a couple things. The first of which is leaving the configuration of the through one parking area um, as it is. The second would be to consider a parking option that um, relocated the playscape closer to the building. Next slide. You can see this is an alternate option. Um, on the south, we would leave the parking area in its current configuration, but maintain the connection to the sidewalk downtown. It would come across to the, you know, in an east-west fashion to the patio that runs north-south between our building and the adjacent building. In this configuration, we would move the playscape from the southwest corner, or in this case, the upper left corner of the image to the, the green inset rectangle adjacent to the building. And then we would move the parking area a little bit to the west that would allow for parking along the, um, the south edge of the athletic fields that would allow for a walkway that connects the academy street um, with all of the parking um, and then it actually conveniently creates space for dumpster and loop circulation around the site so Contrary to me telling you that'll never work, this is actually a very successful option <laughs> that does all of those things. So um, I actually like it. I, I think it's a good option. And this is something that could be taken into consideration. Um, this is the lower level uh, floor plan at the lower level, um, some of the things we did to respond to comments. One, you can see, uh, I can get up and point. Yeah. yeah. That's right. One of the things we did in this 
diagram is we took these two spaces and we made them mechanical spaces. Those spaces are probably going to have to be used to directly communicate with the geothermal fields and we'll need some pump room. We changed the storage room access so that we have some storage room access off the corridor. Uh, we still have access up and down the stairs, but we have space now for digital wayfinding at the lower level of the building. Boiler, electrical, and mechanical rooms would stay the same. We reconfigured the core slightly so that we now have a three-floor stacked electrical room. We have a janitor room on each floor, and we have um, family or non-gender dedicated bathrooms at each floor level. Um, we spent some time talking about this community or what we're calling the reception hall. We renamed it as the reception space. This would be an entertaining space um, and it would be directly adjacent to the kitchen, um, commercial kitchen. Um, next slide. At the main level, um, we made a number of adjustments. One is we created, we use the existing um, openings here to create smaller openings from this side into the cafe space, but there would still be open circulation. But we created more wall space so that we could have, again, digital wayfinding in that, um, in that corridor. We opened up the wall between the lounge and the gymnasium side, and now we're proposing more windows at that level so that we have a visual connection between the hallway and the gymnasium. In the um, gymnasium auditorium, we moved the floor to the, um, to the west, and we've added seating here this would be tiered pull out bleacher seating we can still have some conversation about how much we actually have um, but that would come out and provide elevated seating um, at the back of the um, auditorium and stage configuration um, we still maintain these as multifunction spaces Ooh, this doesn't show. So um, this will still be the cafe. We are going to add millwork at the back of this that was not incorporated. Um, you can see the bathroom core has been revised. We have, in this configuration, we've left the structure in the proscenium opening, and we've removed the stair um, from the front of the stage. We will just have um, steps down from the front of the stage that allows the stage to be as big as it can. And then we would have rear access by the ramp. And then the community spaces on either side will have openings to the uh, recital hall. Next slide. Tom, can I ask one yep. Go back. Um, one thing I don't think we might have mentioned last meeting is um, we had discussed a group, you know, like art space, like for an art show or, or you know, showing artwork throughout. You know, like, a gallery. Like a gallery, there you go, sorry. Um, I think that's something that we definitely want to um, incorporate somehow into this main level. Um, Tom, I don't know how. Is this per were we thinking permanently or like no. the ability to convert a space that way? Yeah, right. Well, the corridors themselves would be configured as gallery space. We'd have gallery lighting and we'd have hanging apparatus along the walls. Um, the community spaces could be used for fixed gallery or platform gallery. So you, you could bring movable partitions in that you can either hang paintings on or sit it on. So I think the facility as a whole is going to maintain that flexibility in all of the community space. Um, at the lower, if you go back to the lower level, at the lower level, um, we, we originally um, envisioned this as gallery space in the corridors as well. And we were showing an opening in 
the wall so that the gallery could actually flow into this community space um, at the lower level. I think you're going to have the flexibility to accomplish that um, in all, at all three levels. Primarily, though, the main level is the best place for it because you have the pre-function space. Um, we'll, we'll take that into consideration and show that detail in the corridors. And then at the third floor, um, we made some small adjustments in that we have the electrical and mechanical spaces now fully stacked vertically. Um, we added a kiln room in what we're calling the arts and crafts space, and we added back in millwork and sinks where they, they were in the existing facility. Um, and then these meeting spaces all stay the same. And we added some, a couple more windows at the upper level to look into the gymnasium. In addition, we've identified the penthouse space as um, common area space in green. One of the things we've changed is we've done our code analysis for you know, plumbing counts, lavatory counts, and we can maintain all of the plumbing in the central core of the building. So we've we've actually chosen to remove some of the old bathrooms from you know the um, sort of uh, outlying positions. There was an old bathroom here in this location which isn't compliant in any way, shape, or form. Um, renovating that would have a pretty high cost per square foot. So this can now be storage or mechanical space. There were small bathrooms within um, the, if you go uh, back one. On the main level, there was a small bathroom in the back of this suite, and there's a bathroom there. It was our position that none of the office suites should have, um, you know, private bathrooms in them unless the committee felt that way. We've removed those. Those are now programmer storage space. Um, and then this was an old bathroom that's in very poor condition. So these will be brand new bathrooms. They'll be stacked. It'll be very efficient um, and it will meet the needs of the whole facility. And there are, will be no travel distance, travel distance, travel distances on any of the three floors that are oppressive or insurmountable. We're talking a really short travel distance, even from the gym to there. Okay. Next slide. So a couple yeah. questions with the upper floor, Tom. Yeah. So. Um, if, if we come into budget issues, um, it seems to me the third floor of an opportunity to try to save some costs potentially. Maybe we don't put windows in the gym because I'm not sure who's going to be up on the third floor on a Saturday morning to watch the game, right? There's no other attraction up there, right? It's just it's it's just the head of services offices, right? Which I don't believe are open on Saturday. I'm not sure. No, so no, typically we wouldn't do a lot of programming on a Saturday. Right. So, um, I mean, is, is there an opportunity and, and just kind of throwing it out there to, to move that craft room down to the, to the lower level, just to, um, um you know what I'm saying? This, the only, the this only... space here, this space here is exceptional. The space itself, you really have to go see it. Um, functionally, this is the space that really it wants to stay that way. Um, well, you know is it possible it could be done at the lower level? Yes. I'm only throwing it out there because it would be the only reason for the community to go up to the third floor, right? With the exception of going to family services, would be to go to that art craft room. Well, you'd have. And there's you'd meeting have, spaces. Yeah, I mean, those are just, we have other yeah, meeting yeah, spaces on other levels too, right? I just. Again, the reason we couldn't put tables is like if people wanted to. That hallway's fairly wide, isn't it? Yep. The one near the gym there. Yeah. Is it wide enough for us to put some seating? 
along? I I don't think the I don't think the idea I think the idea of saving money by not putting windows there is a reasonable option. It's not a huge bite, but it's it's a good call potentially. That makes sense. Um, I don't I don't take exception to that one way. The, the only point that I was trying to make is that the community themselves are only going to go up to the, this upper level just to go to that part of the potentially that other. And, and if we were able to move that raft room down to the other two levels, then does that minimize our, our renovations on this third floor? Because we'd just be basically doing an office build at that point, right? Um, something we can look at. But just something to. No, it's something we can look at. I mean, all the spaces at these levels are going to get new flooring, new lighting, new, you know, get cleaned up, new paint finishes. The only thing that's really above and beyond at this level was the provision of the kiln room and, you know, putting these sinks and millwork back in place. The kiln room is, a, this is a good location for it because it's right below the roof so we can vent directly through the roof. This is the most cost effective place to put it. So this is a good a good spot for it, but that function could certainly be at another level. Or there's a, another way to do it is we drop the electrical and if we don't actually build the room now and that can come in a later phase. Well, I think, right. I mean, that's something that the community wanted was that, that space. So we have to get, find a place for it. Yeah, I hate to lose that. I mean, because it's already got plumbing in there and stuff, right? So, I mean, maybe it doesn't make sense. I was kind of throwing it out there because it, it's the only room there that the community is going to use. Yeah, you, what's the, what are we trying to solve? Like, not having access to that for the weekends? Well, I mean, you potentially could, correct? It could be a safe, we're not heating or cooling that floor, right, Tom, on, on the weekends? Long term. Um, yeah, controls could be set down or set back. It... I mean, the other thing, too, is I don't know. I mean, a lot of the other community centers that we had talked to or discussed, they, they like integrating different offices with different things for safety factor. Because, you know, you could have kids running around on that big floor or upper level. Sorry, on a Saturday, the only thing there is that room, right? They'd be running through. I mean, offices a lot, not to make different offices. But you know what I'm saying? There's nobody else up there. Yeah. Whereas there's a lot going on on the, on the main level, and there's a fitness room, and there's other activities going on in the lower level. Well, I almost want to. Oh, you've got the elevators in the back. I'm saying you could put a door to almost lock the back two thirds of the building off on the third floor and just keep that front part. Of it, but then you wouldn't have access from the elevators. I don't know if we're at. Are we at a point where we need to be doing value engineering? Or we no, no, I just come. I just, I just threw it out as a just a thought. That was. It. It's it's worth keeping in the back of our mind. Um, it's not not a bad idea. Um, oh, so this is just an updated roof plan. We actually walked the roof last week, um, identified where this stuff actually is, and um, have a more detailed assessment of the roof now. Next slide. slide. Um, next slide. So these were just um, some of the renovations, uh, the same elevations. We haven't made any changes to the exterior elevations at this point. Um, we're still working on them. I think we had some images. Maybe next slide. This is the, the model um, still looks the same. I think we added some materials. Next slide. So um, these were some ideas or finishes we wanted to show that so when you come in from that split level um, one of the comments was that maybe there was opportunities for 
Um, maybe there were opportunities for murals, um, particularly in the front lobby. And I just wanted to show that in that entry lobby, the both cheek walls of that entry lobby are going to be two, two and a half story walls. There'll be opportunities for display as well as the face of the elevator enclosure. And then you can see beyond it, we um, shrunk these openings down a little bit. So that creates more gallery space, wayfinding space. These were just some images of how certain entry foyers, stair foyers used murals on the walls. Um, I'm not saying that's what your murals would look like, just opportunity to enliven that entrance space. Next slide. Here is a view of what the cafe space would look like with the clear story up above. So it would be a very tall space. These are the upper floor windows looking down. Um, you can see the cafe and the, the bar, not bar, but um, the millwork behind the bar um, would be a focal wall. And then the space would have soft seating. And then this is a view of the um, renovated gymnasium, this being the stage and the new curtains. Um, it's our intention to put a new proscenium um, on that opening. Um, we have to consult really with the acoustic engineer. And then we envision the space having, you know, padding around the full perimeter of the gym. And the windows would stay. And here's a view looking in the opposite direction with the seating. Um, that's the seating in its closed position. That's as far as we've gotten. We're still still working on it. Um, all of the comments that we received last week were were good. I think we're going to continue to work towards fine tuning the design, creating some renderings, and then hopefully if we have that joint meeting between your committee and the liaison, we can present a re refined design, get you know a final set of comments and um, you know start to move forward to schematics. But it would be beneficial to us if that meeting happens within a week or so maybe within two weeks, because we have to actually complete the schematic design work within them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I did have a couple questions, Tom. Now is the right time to sure. Kind of walk through that stuff. Um, starting in the lower level, uh, the multi-purpose room on the north side of the building shows five thousand square feet. The gym above it shows forty-seven hundred. The room is smaller than the gym, so that's things. probably a mistake. Um, we may have grabbed the full perimeter of all those spaces, um, so I'll confirm that. The only reason why that's I, I care about that is because it looks like we're showing columns in that space. We're calling that a fitness room, and I'm just concerned about what the layout of the columns was. If you're going to have a dance class, and there's columns all in the middle of the room. It might not be that effective. Do we need a budget for putting beams in to open up certain sections of that? Is that a line item we should be considering or not? If we're going to do fitness stuff, um, probably not. Activities that can happen within the space with the columns would happen there. I would think then if there's activities that need to be programmed um, in a more open space, that could happen in the gymnasium. Uh, I don't. I don't know offhand if we. I mean, physically, I know it's possible to change the structure from very low in there to begin with. It's like eight feet to the underside structure. Mm -hmm. So 
um, going through the gymnastics of putting structure under there, I don't know if it would be financially beneficial. Um, so the space is open, so it can be an activity space. Austin sees it as a viable programming space. Um, I, I think we just have to work around it. Again, the center has a lot of multifunction spaces. So yeah. I think in some cases we're gonna have, you know, it's gonna become a programming issue. Like, do we hold the dance class in the recital hall, which is wide open, or in the gymnasium, or half the gymnasium, right? The goal is to have a you know a curtain separating the gym. Okay. So you can use both sides for different types of activities. So uh, it's a good question. We can look at it further if this committee directs us to go with that. Yeah, I, I haven't, I didn't get as far as to put two and two together from what that the other committee was saying would be a good use of that space or not. I just remember us having conversations about that being more fitness oriented, maybe padding on the floors and, and mirrors on the walls. And like it was going to be more oriented towards fitness programming. And if that was the case, I just want to make sure it was. But they can get inoperable for people that would choose it for that purpose. Sure, but it's not unreasonable for a space like that to do dance lessons or to do yoga classes or Tai Chi, um, where you can do that sort of in a line behind the instructor, um, but you, you're not impeded by the columns. The columns just become a small you know, visual impediment. You're shifting one way or the other. Yeah. So there are a lot of classes that can be held in those spaces with its configuration, but you're not going to play pickleball in there. No, no, no. But I know, like my my wife does uh, yoga, and I know something that's important to them is being able to see themselves while they're doing the activity. Sure. So if you end up behind the column, you don't you well, don't have the same access. So they end up actually putting mirrors on the columns. They mirror the columns to make it work for them. So. There's options, but I didn't know if there was, if the columns were so close together that it was like, it's just kind of useless for us, or if it was something we had to think about. Uh, it doesn't sound like it's necessarily an impediment for us. Uh, the other question I had on the main floor, we're showing cutouts into the cafe space. Do we, you know, on the, West side of the building where the main entrance is going to be. Do we want that to feel more open? It looks like it's got a lot of small doorways now. Would, is that something we want to consider as a more open space? Like, do we want it to feel like a room that you enter? Do we want it to feel like part of a, a larger main floor? I think that's a great concern. We originally had it more open. I think this was a reaction to you know having more wayfinding, um, digital signage, but it probably wants to be more a little bit more open. Um, I liked it more open, yeah, as a designer. Um, but you know, again, we're responding to comments and we're making adjustments. Yeah, and I think we've got to find everything's a compromise, right? I think we just as a Need to decide is that we're willing to make a compromise in one way to meet a need another, but um, and then the last on the third floor, the all of the youth and family service space is labeled as offices. Are those actually individual people's offices, or are they just rooms that they're? using at like for community space. Oh, there they actually have staff in, in those offices. So where all of the yellow is um, on the plan, those are actual staff offices, counseling offices. Um, those are pretty those are dedicated staff okay. space. So there I counted 16 in total. So is that the we have 16 staff that need private offices or we have well, I can respond. Would you like me to respond? To that? Yeah, that would be great. I'm just trying yes. to make sure. I'm so sure. the vast majority of all of those would have a staff person that we have on staff now. Uh, I guess my board. There's two uh, larger spaces on um, on the 
larger that, 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 that side of, of most of our suites that we have for family therapy appointments. That, that was woven into our request for spaces of that size. So they have to accommodate a therapist or two therapists and a, what could be a family of up to four or five other people. So there's those two family therapy spaces probably would not be assigned to a staff. They'd be rotated through uh, our interns and our contractual folks, which is what we do now, but we do that with less offices. If you tour the youth family services now, they have that amount of staff and those amount of offices. The only difference is some of their offices now is actually a, a closet. Like one office is literally a closet. It's like four feet wide and about nine feet deep. Um, yeah. So yes, these are staff that are already in place. Okay. So is that is there a, is there going to be a need for that to grow at some point? Are we accounting for that being a steady state for that? <sighs> My, I apologize. My, um, I, I, I think that these in the future or something. If they had to, yeah, I, I think if we if we had to grow, we would have offices where you could begin to double up again, which is kind of what we're doing now. Um, what, what we do now with two or three offices and six staff, we'd be hoping to do it with you know now with you know five or six offices where they would be able to schedule a little bit better. Uh, I don't anticipate us growing. Um, much in the next five to 10 years. So I, I do feel good about what we're estimating. Um, the mental health needs have, have skyrocketed. I mean, it's been kind of ridiculous these last couple of years. So assuming this kind of levels out and we can keep our staffing where it is, we should be fine. And I'm very happy with, with what, what Tom has presented to us. I think that fits with everything we've studied and had consultants talk to us about for the last 10 years. Okay. Um, and then, my last question was some of the entrances are not showing any awning or like weather coverings. Is that something we should be thinking about now? Is it something we would like hold on afterwards? That's well, that's something we can consider the existing building. We were keeping the existing entrances without adding awnings, just from a historical perspective. Historic perspective, we we're going to clean up the existing skin. We weren't going to change those entrances. We can talk to Shippo about that. Um, the new entrance obviously would have awnings or protection. right. I saw one there. I was thinking about the other entrances. If there's, if you have a lot of season ice and rain and all sorts of things happen so is there should we be thinking about protecting those and then obviously there's probably conversations with the sort of side and stuff we're allowed to do that i wasn't actually thinking about it it's a good idea um i think you know from a security and safety perspective and observation perspective i think generally we want everyone coming in and out the same entrance and that those entrances would most of the time just be exit only, like for either emergencies or convenience if you park down the street. Okay. But Mike, I don't know this, it's an operational issue, but I'm guessing that those entrances might be closed a lot of the time or secured a lot of the time. Um, you'll have the flexibility to change that based on your programming and what's going on for a night. Um, normally, the exterior entrances we recommend they're all on a card access system. So, through the building management controls, the town's facility director can open and close all the doors or close the doors or lock them down remotely or provide access pretty easily. But um, from a security standpoint, you might want to try and control ingress of the building through the main entrance most of the time. So I didn't necessarily see those side entrances as having a lot of traffic, but we can consider um, putting on it there. What do you guys think? Betting that 
most of those side entrances are going to be used primarily as exits. Yeah, that's what Tom was saying. So uh, maybe it's an Austin question just to clarify if that's what his intention is as well. But like the front entrance, if they do a show or something, I imagine that opens up so that you could use that front auditorium. Um, there is one thing we haven't gotten to a lot of detail on that, that like on that south elevation, right? That's the main focus point from from Route One, right? That's where the traffic's going to go, the foot traffic's going from town. So right, that do you know? I know you haven't shown much detail yet there yet, but um, it's something definitely you want to look at, you know, going forward. I think from the committee and exactly how that's going to look at the front. You know. um, right. right. Yeah, we haven't designed it. Incorporated a patio into there. Yeah, that was one of the proposals I think the committee liked. Yeah, that. somebody had like a um, had a patio with actually like a, a wheelchair access ramp on one side, so you could get up to the, the elevation of the door. Mm -hmm. You know, as a as a I mean, it it's definitely something. We're probably spending money we don't have. Well, we're trying but, to but get I'm saying, the, I mean, but these are functional <laughs> functional items that may you know be good for the community, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think Ann might have a couple questions. No, I don't. You don't? No. I see you toggling through the planes. Yeah, because you know, so I wanted oh. to, you know, I just wanted to see what the, what the front end looks like right now. Yeah, there you go. See that? There's a Jeep and a taco truck. <laughs> I mean, part of the nature of the building is it's beautiful, it's an existing state, and our goal was, our plan was to restore it. Um, for the finishes, it wasn't necessarily to change it or change the aesthetic, but adding a canopy is something that could potentially be functional. Um, we can look at that. Yeah, I think we're, at least from my perspective, I'm trying to balance maintaining the, the spirit of the building, but also making it a really nice community center, right? And like somewhere the community sort of gets attracted to. And if there's a there's a part of the building that doesn't achieve that goal. I'd be open to an idea to say, hey, there's a there's a change we want to make to the building to make it more functional for the community, even if it it may modify the exterior to some degree. I think that's a conversation we could have as, as a group. Say, not just to say exterior stays the same at all costs and you know function. Is thrown out the window in, in service of form. That makes sense. Well, we're looking for flexibility, right? This building's not in its final state come next year when it's done, right? Things are going to evolve, right? Five years from now, different things are going to be. Pickleball might be out, might be peeling the tape off the floor. Right. right? <laughs> but I mean, you know, yeah. different things pop up, and, you know, the more flexibility we have with spaces that we can. You know, so this is a 50 off. year building, right? Is I mean, it's going to evolve. Right? This isn't you know, one shot deal here. So. So yeah, the more spaces we have available. Well, with dividers and we can you know. Well, that's something we certainly can look at. Thank you much, Tom. Thank you. So when um so when do we expect like the next um so if we set up this our our joint committee meeting um set in the next week or so it would be good for you. Or I, our next meeting is, I believe, on the 23rd. Is that uh, correct, John? Uh, <laughs> oh, you're, the one that cracks, you're, you're the one that corrects me on my Mondays and Tuesdays. So yes. I think it's on the 23rd. 23rd. <laughs> well, I guess if, if, if that can be, if at that meeting you could. Is that if that's too late, we could schedule something for next week. Oh, I'm in June, I'm sorry. No, I I will be back. I'm away the week of the 15th to the 19th. So the 23rd is is fine. And if you can invite that. Jeannie, can we do that? Can we just add it? And can we just modify our regular meeting to add an agenda item to 
this would be a special you, meeting. Yeah. Well, we actually want to use our regular scheduled meeting because Tom's on away is away next week. Mm -hmm. So the 23rd is our regular scheduled meeting where we want to have the advisory committee come. Yeah, that's just an agenda item. Okay, yeah. Jim is adding an agenda item to invite them. Yeah. Okay. So it's at some point we'll get some like 3D modeling and be able to like walk through the building. No, we're working on that. Yeah. Yeah. So then we can answer some of the AJ's questions on uh, what's open and what's not, right? The walls. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's there. It's a lot of work. So we're, oh, we're moving in that direction. Awesome. Um, I know we don't have the item on here, but is there any other comments from the public or from anybody online? Yeah. Uh, um, just to the point about the art room on the upper level. Um, I do feel like that does make sense up there. So when you go up on that floor, that room really is, it was an art room, it, it really does sort of beg to be that again. And we just encourage you guys, I realize that we take up a good amount of space on the, on the upper level, I'm, I'm obviously very aware of that. But to think about that, the spaces that are up there that you would, I think just my, wearing my uh, Academy Advisory hat, I think there are spaces up there that would be very inviting. We do want to invite the public up there because it, it is a part of the entire community center. So to have spaces up there that are really designed to draw public up, even if they were coming up on a Saturday to watch a basketball game through a window. I think it, it just, it, the more inviting I think we make the entire building, the better off we are. And you could expect us to be very good tenants and, and very welcoming uh, towards the public. Part of the idea, part of Peggy's vision she brought up the idea of, of, of having you and family and Beach and Rec occupy areas of that building was that we could partner and we could do more more uh, community-based programming. So I I, I just want to make it clear, you know, we even though we are occupying a good amount of that space, it's not that we are closing ourselves off to the public. It's quite the opposite. We really want to be very involved, and we want that that, that whole building. I just want to make sure that that part was clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I was only bringing it up more for, for budgetary oh, constraints. Well, I, if this... I, yeah, no, I understand that. Yeah. Um, I do. Uh, it's just a great space for, um, for an army. Yeah. And it is some relatively high priority yeah. community interests that are, that are captured up there as well. Well, so thank you. So, hi. <laughs> I'm Ross Kama, 31 Island Avenue, and um, I'm a designer, full disclosure. Tom um, knows uh, I've been thinking about this project a long time. Al has invited me to attend these meetings. Um, so, representing a lot of thinking from previous committees, talking to a lot of other agencies in town. Uh, I would just uh, ask you, Tom, to consider um, to think about this. And you know, there were some comments about how we engage people as they just go by the building. I happen to live on Island Avenue. This is a very popular place to gather, to start walks. I think, and it may tip into some of your issues related to budget. But public outdoor gathering spaces are important. We don't own the green. And so this really becomes a town asset at this end of town. And that was part of what we were trying to do uh, was connect the library to the community center. And I begin to beg you to think about the community center down to the waterfront walk. I just drove down just now from Manchester by the sea and They've done this beautiful job up in Massachusetts alone, their beautiful community to encourage these loops and walks and have put public spaces where people can gather. So I just ask you to look carefully at that and consider it for um, from a budgetary point of view. The Madison Historical Society has a lot of wonderful um, interest in the building and in the facade, but also in artifacts that are available. So I would recommend you getting in touch with Jenny Simpson. She's done some homework ahead of time and could offer some resources. Um, 
I also think it's important for public spaces to have a breeder or a reception space. I think it's important that we welcome people in. Some people won't want to engage, but they might want to come in, whether it's manned or not. So to your point about opening up that area, create a welcome space, not just necessarily um, a wayfinding tool, but a place when it's going to be very active that someone could be there. And I also think you should think about it as really important for adults as well as children. So if you have a kid intensive program going on most weekends, that there's places for adults to come in. So to your point, bring them up into the building. Um, there's some wonderful examples of how that can be done looking at other spaces. Um, and I think the last comment I want to make is um, yeah, think about offices a little differently. There's a lot of work being done to not just give people four walls in the door. And so there may be ways to create private conferencing spaces, but think about officing a little bit more creative, which may give you some flexibility in spaces when not occupied. Thank you. Any other comments, right there? All right, I think we have uh, hit the end of our agenda. So, with, um, yes, there are no objections, the meeting's adjourned. <laughs>